Praise the Lord, everyone. If you're staying with me at this time, we're going to open this service. Psalm 145, 1 through 3 says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. We serve an awesome God. We could never fathom finding out and understanding the depths of how amazing he is. As I was on my way to work this morning in my car, and I pray like I usually do, I just started to stop and think about how awesome God is. And I just began in my finite mind began to just tell him who he was, who I know him to be. But then I think out of all the things I just said, he's so much more. His ways are past finding out, the Bible says. We serve an awesome God. And what it does is it causes me to desire to love him more and more. And that's what this scripture is saying today. I want to praise him forever and ever. So why don't we start tonight by praising him? And let's praise the Lord in his sanctuary tonight. Let's go before the Lord in prayer as we open this service. God, you are so amazing. You are so wonderful, God. Lord, we're not even worthy of your attention tonight, God. But Lord, you're, you are very interested Lord, and where we're at, God, and what we're doing tonight, Jesus. Lord, we have come into your house, Jesus. Lord, this is your time. Lord, we focus upon you, God. We're not here just to get it over with, Lord. We're not here just to go through the motions. We're here to worship and honor you, God, to focus on who you are, Jesus. Oh, to us and to everyone else in this place, God, you are wonderful and worthy to be praised, Jesus. Lord, we honor you, God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
know you serve the Almighty God tonight. He has all power, all authority, dominion. Oh, He can do all things. Amen. We serve a mighty God tonight. And then Peter told us to casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. We just sang about all the power He has, all the dominion and authority that He has, and He cares for you. And so we cast our cares upon Him because no matter what the doctor says, no matter what your finances says, no matter what your lost loved ones say or the lies of the enemy, whatever the devil whispers in your ear, none of those people have the final say. None of them reign. Our God is the one who reigns. Amen? Amen. Let's go before our great God in prayer tonight. If you have a need, let it be known by an uplifted hand. They'll put our names on the board. And let's cast our cares upon him. Lord Jesus, we love and exalt and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are, Lord. You are so good, so faithful to us, Lord. So mighty, powerful, glorious. Lord, we thank you for all that you are and that you care for us. So right now, we want to lift before you every need represented in the house tonight. Lord, you see everyone who needs healing in their body. Lord, you know every situation that needs deliverance. Lord, you are well able to make a way. We pray that you part the seas where there seems to be no way. Slay the giants that stand before us, Lord. Provide the healing, the peace, the deliverance. Bring the prodigals home. Do all these mighty works that only you can do, Lord. And we will continue to worship and to honor and to praise you for it. Oh, in the mighty and wonderful matchless name of Jesus, we pray all this. Oh, amen. Lord's good, isn't he? Amen. If our ushers want to go ahead and get ready to come forward, we're going to continue in worship through giving tonight. If I could get uh, Sister Nyla up here. Doesn't it feel good in the house of the Lord tonight? Feels good to be here, and I'm excited for what the Lord has done already, what He's continuing to do. If you would all lift your hands, lift your voices, and pray with us. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given back to me. Press down, shaking together, and running over. I'm a tither, I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You proud upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and walking with God, perfect health and abundance to walk and demand favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. You can march and give your offering under the direction of our ushers. And let's keep worship.
deserving tonight. Lord, we love you. God, we praise and magnify you, Jesus. As we sing about how much he deserves it, the only thing I can think about is how much we don't deserve it. We don't deserve everything that God does for us, yet he does it anyways. He loves us anyways. He forgives us anyways. We serve a great God, and he is deserving of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. And you may be seated this evening. We welcome you all to Eagle Bend Apostolic Church to midweek service tonight. Amen. We are thankful you're here. We welcome all those joining us by way of the web. Amen. And we're excited to be in his house. And I'm excited for Bible study tonight as we... We dig into the Word and continue our Real Talk series. Uh, a couple announcements before we dismiss our classes. First, we hope to see everyone this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. for Sunday school, 11.15 for service, and, of course, pre-service prayer begins at 9 a.m. 
Uh, please make sure to sign up for one or more of our prayer shifts. Uh, those have been going very well. For those that have been showing up consistently and praying, you, you know it makes a difference. Not only here in the services, but it makes a difference here too. When consistent prayer, it, it, it works, folks. It works. And so, again, those prayer shifts Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., uh, there are openings and there are sign-up sign up sheets in the front lobby. And, of course, you can find all of our events information, small groups info, calendar, and how to give all on our EBAC mobile app. And we're going to dismiss our classes tonight, beginning with our nursery class, our littles class, which is two to five years old. You can be dismissed, and we'll also dismiss our children's choir. All, all children, kindergarten through 11, you can be dismissed. And as they're clearing out, I'll invite everybody, if you would, to, if you want to move up to these front two sections here, as we, we've been doing the last several Wednesdays. More and more just are figuring it out that I'm going to ask you to move, and they're just sitting up here, so I commend them. But amen. Again, not going to force you to move. You're not, you're, you're not going to be cast out. Amen. I thank you all again for for being here, and um, I have I have very much enjoyed um, this series thus far. I thought last last week we had a a great discussion on the principle of giving and tithing, and and looked at that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when we when I approached uh, Bishop Triplett about the idea of what of what we're doing, this whole concept, that's something I. I took to him weeks before we ever had our first session of this and kind of ran it by him and was like, you know, I've had a thought, maybe not a holy thought, but I've had a thought and uh, kind of want to run it by you. And, and uh, I, I try to run every every thought I have or anything we mix up or do something different, I always run it by Bishop first. And, uh, and there's a lot of wisdom there, and I'm thankful for his wisdom. And so I ran the idea by him, and, and uh, it was a day or two later. Uh, as as usual, he'll call me with either an idea or something to convey, and it just it hits him while he's in the middle of doing something, and he's going to call me right when it hits him, and uh, and, and dump it on me and say, okay, bye, and hang up. And uh, and so this was one of the thoughts he, he had, and, and and again, it's something that I've I've taken to heart, is that is, you know, he said, when, when we start getting into these questions, he said, I think it'd be great to have some of our other ministers take some of these questions as well, you know, as you begin going through them if there's a question that you think one of our other ministers could could take and just you know, just a single question and let them have it and uh and again I think that's that's a tremendous idea and so I, I we I had a question that that was submitted and it was actually I think even the first week but again I've got lots of questions we'll be going through uh, in this series I still I have two or three prepared that we didn't even get to we didn't even finish the the first question last week and, and went for like an hour and that was your fault not mine y'all talked longer than I did so uh, that's on you but uh, but tonight uh, the question that's going to be answered or and I'll, I'll just read read the card it says I am confused about the oneness verse Trinity argument and I would love to know more it's he said it has been explained to me a few times but I'm still confused and um, and there is there is one 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 minister here that when it comes to oneness doctrine and comes to Acts two thirty eight that I, I turn to quite frequently, and that is Pastor Gary Gwynn. And so I'm gonna ask him if he wants to come right now and uh, and he's gonna uh, he's gonna sit right here and we're gonna do like we've been doing and so he's gonna talk for a little bit and I'll I'll let him make his own rules and parameters of how he wants to handle it. But again the question we, we are addressing is is uh, uh, about oneness and trinity and uh i've asked pastor gwen to come and explain that that bottle of water is yours brother and uh so why don't y'all give pastor gwen a hand tonight right, and 
depending on how long he talks, we got plenty of questions. We can keep on going. If it takes all night, then we'll do that, and we'll pick back up next week. Thank you, Pastor, for those kind words. But I love the Word of God. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> I know some of you just got through eating a bunch of barbecue, and you probably probably got a heavy stomach, and don't let it affect your eyelids and get sleepy on me. So we're going to... We're going to answer this question together tonight, and uh, I've got a lot of scripture that I'm going to read. I'm going to start in Genesis and go to Revelation. I'm not going to be here all night now, so don't get get upset, but uh, if you have a question or comment, write it down. If you got to know the answer, wave your hand, holler at me, because I don't see too good, so I may miss you, but uh, anyway, um, this is a good question that someone asked, and and when I, he gave me this question, why it, it kind of thrilled me to know that somebody's hungry. You know, they're reaching out for more of God. And I like to see that, but this, this individual, I'm sure there's more other than this individual that has this question that's here tonight. And I know going out over the airways, there's probably somebody out there that don't, don't really understand who God is. So maybe the time we get through tonight, they will have a little bit of an idea of who God really is. But he said, I'm confused about the oneness versus the Trinity argument. And he said, I would love to, to know more. That's great. It's been explained to me a few times, and I'm still confused. Well, uh, I can relate to his question. I'm going to start the first thing and cover the Trinity. And I can relate to this question because I was there at one time. I was raised in a Trinitarian church and um, I was always confused about uh, the doctrine and, and I never could really understand who to pray to. I'd have a problem and I'd say, well, I don't have the Holy Ghost so I can't go to him. Uh, so I do, I take this problem and question to Jesus or do I go to God Almighty the Father I was always confused but when God gave me revelation now I know I'll just go to God you know if you have revelation of truth tonight you need to be thankful there's so many people out there that really don't know who God is and uh, so uh, I'm going to address the first question was he brought it was Trinity, and um, I'm not going to dwell on it long, but I'm just going to state where it come from. Uh, the word Trinity, a lot of people don't know this, but the word Trinity is not even in the Bible. You can search it from Genesis to Revelation. You can do whatever you want. You can Google it, but it's not there. Um, so the first teaching of this doctrine of Trinity started in, um, with a man named Tertullian, and this, this man, he lived in uh, 150 to 225 A.D. So actually he was in uh, a little space after the apostles had been here and they taught their, the doctrine that Jesus gave them. And they had all died off and the church went on. But this man, he, uh, I guess uh, he got a revelation, he claims, and uh, you know, all revelations are not from God. If the Spirit and the Word don't agree, it's not from God. But anyway, he got a revelation of this uh, doctrine of Trinity. And uh, so the teachings of this started around 210 A.D. And his, his name was Tertullian, and he was a lawyer, he was a teacher. But he was the first Christian writer to co call God the Trinity and the first one of the of the father they call, so they called him he's the first one to speak of God into three three persons so they've called him the father of the Christian uh, Trinitarian but uh, his teachings went on and up in the year of 381 at the uh, Council of Constantinople Trinity was adopted by the Christian church and at that time, the Catholic Church, it was called the Catholic Church, which 
there's a lot of splits and we've been studying this in Sunday school with Sister Triplett and she's covered this really, really good and there's so many different doctrines came about about that time and uh, that's where a lot of the churches got started, this church, that church. But anyway, um, I wanted to kind of cover that, that where Trinity came from, the Trinitarian doctrine. It's not in the Bible. Uh, the Bible does not cover it in any way. So um, we'll put that behind us because it's just a doctrine that this man came up with, and it stuck around a lot of years. And uh, so what we want to look at tonight is the one true God. And uh, we're going to study a little bit about God and who he is. Now, a lot of this is going to be, um, you know, some of you here understand it fully. But there's some here that don't. There's some online that don't. So help me preach it and get the word out. Somebody's eyes be open. God, if God will open their eyes and reveal to them if they're hungry, then they'll, they'll understand the one true God. But... We start with God is a spirit. We all know that the Bible says God is a spirit. And uh, if, if uh, we let the spirit lead and guide us, he'll lead us and guide us into all truths. So it, it kind of starts with, with that, having a desire to know the truth. Now, in our Sunday school class last Sunday, Sister Triplett brought out the point that, that um, if, if you want to understand the Bible, God is the author. If you want to understand it, get the author down inside your heart. And it says, holy men of old, moved on by the Holy Ghost, wrote this word. It's God's word. So if we get the author of the Holy Ghost down in our heart, then he will explain and lead us into all truths. So that's the key to it is getting God inside of us and saying, God, I don't understand Teach thou me. Like Job. Job said one time, said, God, that I don't understand. Teach thou me so I'll understand it. So I'm going to start in Genesis. And uh, well, like I say, we're going to go all the way into Revelation. If you have a question or something you don't understand, a comment, wave, wave at me, holler or something. But if you can, if you want to wait till the end of the lesson, then we'll open the floor up. We'll discuss, talk, do whatever you want to do. But I want to start in Genesis 1 and 1. And uh, it, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That, that's just about as simple as you can get. In the beginning God created. And you notice it says God. And it's singular. It ain't God's. Uh, it's God. God Almighty. He created the heavens and the earth. And... Uh, I want to go over to uh, verse 26 and touch on a subject before we go on. But uh, we know God created everything, and he gets to verse 26 on the sixth, sixth day. And, and, uh, or, and he said, uh, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So this has been a confusing to a lot of people when they read this. See, God, hear what he's doing. Um, he said, let us make man. He's counseling with his own mind. Now, if we go to uh, Colossians, uh, did she put that up there? Let's see. Give me one second. Ephesians. Sorry. Ephesians 1 and 11. Anyway, let me read it. I can't find it here. It said, uh, in the last part of this verse, it says, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. So when God was making man, you know, he's, I'm guilty of this myself. You be out working, doing something, you say, well, let's see. 
I'm by myself, you know, and I'll say, let's see. Well, what I'm doing, I'm counseling with my own mind. And I'll say, well, I, th- I don't like this. Let's change this. Or are we gonna, we're going to go over here and put this over there. But I'm talking to myself basically what I'm doing, counseling with my own mind. This is what God did when he created man. He's, he's looking ahead. He's counseling with his mind because he's looking ahead. He knows he's creating man in the flesh. He knows man is going to sin. He knows God knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. So he knows he's looking down in time, and he knows that man, he gives man a free choice. He can live righteous or evil as a choice. But God knows that he's making us out of flesh, the dust of the earth, and we're going to fail and we're going to sin. And he knows down through time that he's going to have to come and give himself a sacrifice for the sin of the world. So he, ha- he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So God already had a plan that when he came to this world as a savior, what that likeness and image would be. So he created us in his image. So um, anyway, so much for that. Uh, but in the beginning, God by self, created the heavens and earth. Now keep that in mind as we go along. I want to go on up to Deuteronomy 6 and 4. And, and uh, we, we know in the Old Testament, it was always God, God this, God that, God commanded, God moved, and God this. And He chose Abraham and his seed. to bring. He was going to bring forth the Savior. He, he knew he was going to come as a Savior through this line. So... Uh, all the way through, God is teaching his people. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, very familiar scripture. And he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Not two, not three, but one Lord. And uh, so then we, we go on up into the end, toward the end of the Old Testament. And we get into the uh, prophets. And uh, God spoke to these prophets. And uh, one of them was Isaiah. Now, I want to be honest with you. There is so much scripture on one God that that I'll never cover it tonight. So I'm going to try to hit the high places, the high spots, and uh, there's probably four or five times the scripture that we could look at. But we go to Isaiah 44 and 6, and God says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, And besides me, there is no God. That's pretty plain. I mean, this is God Almighty. And he says, and God always identifies himself when he speaks. And here he says, the Lord, the King of Israel, and the Redeemer. Well, he knows down through the ages he is going to be the Redeemer. But he makes it pretty plain. I'm the first, I'm the last, and besides me, there is no, no God. Now, Keep that in mind. We're going to get on over into New Testament here after a while, and you're going to see them same words. But Isaiah 45 and 21, and he says, And there is no God else besides me, a just God and a Savior. Well, here's God in Isaiah saying, I am the Savior. There is none beside me. God's making it pretty plain. I'm it. I'm the one and only. We go to Hosea chapter 13, verse 4. And he said, I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. Here God identifies himself one more time. He said, thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. Pretty powerful words. This is in the Old Testament. Jesus has not been born yet. No Savior besides me. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now this verse, you will see this at Christmas time in about every Christmas card. You'll see it on church bulletin boards across the land everywhere. People will read this and they don't really look at the words and what they're reading. In other words, I don't believe their eyes have been opened to who God really is. But here... It says, for unto us a child is born. Now Isaiah is prophesying 
about a Savior, a Messiah that is coming. He's not born yet. But he says, unto us a child is born. He's talking about Jesus. Unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God here. And he said, His name shall be called the Mighty God. His name shall be called the Everlasting Father. His name shall be called the Prince of Peace. So here we're getting a little insight into who Jesus really is. Isaiah's prophesied about it. So, I want to go from there. I want to go to John chapter 1 in the New Testament. John kind of explains this pretty good. I heard a man tell me one time, he said, if you read John chapter 1, and if you don't see that Jesus is the Almighty God, said you, you know, you, you just need to read it again. But this kind of explains very well. But John said in verse number one, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's pretty simple. That kind of goes back to Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created. He says here, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse number three said, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Well, we can all agree with that. God said in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Everything was made by God. Go to verse number 10. He said, he was in the world. The world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Now, who's he talking about here? Talking about Jesus. Jesus was in the world. He says the world was made by him. So that tells me these are the two same people. And the world knew him not. Jesus was here. He walked up and down the shores of Galilee. They didn't know him. Never, never knew who he was. Going over to verse number 14. Here's, here's the key right here. This word that we've been talking about, it says the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. What does John said 3.16? said, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. Here it says. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Alright. So we see here. John is saying. God Almighty come in flesh and dwelt among us. All right. So the flesh was made, the, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God Almighty. We'll go to 1 Timothy 3 and 16. 1 Timothy 3 and 16. These are all powerful verses. It says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Should be no controversy. There's too much scripture in this Bible that tells us who God is. And here he says, God was manifest in the flesh through Jesus Christ. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. God preached unto the Gentiles. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He said he was believed on in the world and received up into glory. We know Jesus came and, uh, he, you know, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So here Paul is writing to Timothy. Evidently the church there was having some controversy on you know, they had the Jews and Gentiles, and the Jews didn't accept Jesus. The Gentiles didn't know who he was. So he was having some controversy over the Godhead and uh, godliness. So, so Paul was writing to Timothy, and he gave him this instruction. It's pretty simple. Timothy, God was manifest in the flesh. So anyway, I want to go to Colossians 1 and 14. I 
I had all this marked, but I've lost it. I could blame that on my wife, but I, she down there knew. Well, here we go. <laughs> all right. Colossians 1, 14 through 19. Here again, Paul's writing to the church, and he says, uh, go and start at verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Whose blood? Jesus' blood. Okay, he goes on, verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So he says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We know God is a spirit. Verse 16, for by him, talking about Jesus, were all things created. Now, wait a minute. God said he created everything. How can God create everything? Yet here we're talking about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. It says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, all means all, were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he said Jesus is before all things. He was back there in Genesis 1 and 1 before that. And he is the head of the body, the church of believers that we are here tonight. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. All the fullness of God. The image of the invisible God. Colossians 2 and 9. For in him, talking about Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Again, all just means all. Another, no other explanation for that. For he in him dwelleth. I want to go to John chapter 10 and verse 30. Jesus made a statement to the people there that day, his disciples and other people around. And he said, I and my Father are one. And kind of dropped it there and went on. But the uh, disciples, you know, it kind of, kind of, I guess, stuck in their mind and uh, go over to John chapter 14, verse number 5. And this thought that he said stuck with him. And verse 5 here, it says, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And, and from henceforth ye, ye know him and have seen him. He's kind of kind of trying to drop the hint to him. Uh, do you not understand where I'm going? But Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father and it suffices us or it will satisfy us. Lord, if you'll just show us the father, we'll be satisfied. So Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then show us the Father? In other words, you see me, you've seen the Father. Me and the Father are one. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. So he makes it pretty plain to his disciples, I am the Father. You see me, you have seen the Father. Me and the Father, we are one. I want to go back to uh, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. And like I said a few minutes ago, God always identifies itself 
when he speaks. And um, here we find that God is calling Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he tells Moses he wants him to go back and lead the children out. And Moses says, God, I can't even talk plain. Um, They're not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. And Pharaoh, he's the king. I'm just an old shepherd out here. What what am I going to tell these people to get their attention? God said, tell them I am that I am. In other words, he said, I am the I am. And when you tell them that, they'll know who I am. So um, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43 and start at verse 3. Forty-three and verse three, he said, "For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior." Here again, he's telling the children of Israel who he is. In verse number ten, "Ye are my witness," saith the Lord, "and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He." There again, he he says, "I am." That's that's his. Uh, everybody knows him. He says, I am, I am. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Pretty plain, I'm it. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. So he's the one, he's the God, he's the Savior, he's the one in all. Verse number 13, he said, Yea, before the day was, I am he. Notice he's saying, I am he. So we go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We're going to look at another I am here. Notice Jesus said, I, or God says, I am. John chapter 8, verse number 53. Here the, Jesus is talking to the disciples and um, Abraham comes up, subject Abraham. And they asked, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who, who makest thou thyself? Or who are you, Jesus? And uh, Jesus answered them, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, and of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep to his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Verse 57, then, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? It's kind of, Jesus kind of blowing their mind. He's trying to say, well, I know Abraham. I knew Abraham. And they say, wait a minute, you ain't even 50 years old. How, how come you say you know or you've seen Abraham? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Remember what God said? I am that I am. I am he. Here Jesus is saying the very same thing. Before Abraham was I am. So he's trying to open their eyes to who he is. And they just can't see it. And uh, you see, Jesus, when he healed the, the lame man, he just simply told him, said, thy sins are forgiven you. Pick up your bed and walk. Well, the Jews, the people there that day said, whoa, that's blasphemy. You can't do that. Only God can forgive sin. He said, you're not hearing what I'm saying. He forgave the man of his sins. 
So he has that right because he's almighty God in the flesh. So anyway, God is, is trying to open their eyes and understand it to who he really is. So I want to go to Revelation chapter 1. And Revelation is, uh, most of you know, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ that he uh, revealed himself and the things to come in the end to John while John was on the Isle of Patmos. And uh, Jesus revealed to John a lot of good stuff here. But Revelation 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to John, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. This verse right here is powerful. First of all, he says, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. This is Jesus talking. So he said, I'm the first, I'm the last, I'm the, I'm the beginning, and I am the ending. He said, which is, I'm present, which was, and is to come in the future. But then he finishes off by saying, the Almighty. Now you can't have but one Almighty. Amen. You can't have two Almighties. Amen. One of them is going to be less powerful than the other. So Jesus said, I am the Almighty. In other words, I am God Almighty. God says, I am the Almighty. Jesus says, I'm the Almighty. Well, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He could say that. So, the Almighty. We go to verse number 10. He said, John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Go down to verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in garment down to his feet and, his, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. He said his head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. Now this, this that he's saying says, like unto the Son of Man, that's Jesus. Okay, if you go back, I'll stop right there, but... You can go back to Daniel chapter 7. I'm not going to go there tonight. Like I say, there's so many more scriptures we can look at to back up. But Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 10, Daniel saw a vision of God Almighty. And the same person Daniel saw is right here what John saw of Jesus. So it tells us the same person. They look the same. You go down to verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. Who was that? That was Jesus. He lived and he died, but he didn't stay there. He said, Behold, I am alive forevermore. So this is a description of Jesus and it's the exact same description as God Almighty. All right. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. Now this is at the very end of great white throne judgment. Everything's over with. The Bible says we'll all stand before God, give an account of the deeds done in this body. And here John said, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. He didn't say them. He said him. 
him, one, sat on it. Revelation 21 and 5. And he that sat upon the throne. And again, he, singular, one, he sat upon the throne. Okay, I want to... Uh, Verse 6, he went on saying, he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Again, he identifies himself. And he that sat upon the throne. Go back to Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 2. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Not three, not two, but one. One sat on the throne. God Almighty. So, <clears throat> we see that all the way from Genesis to Revelation, it's just one. So we'll go to 1 John chapter and verse 7 finish up with this verse right here and uh, my bedtime <clears throat> First John chapter 5 and verse 7 this kind of sums all of it up right here there are, there are three that bear record in heaven the Father the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are how many? one You know, when I was pastoring at the Towers, I always told them, I said, I want you to get a Bible. When I preach, I want you to read it along with me. What I say, is, you know, is one thing, but what the Bible says will stand forever. And, and all I said, if you go to a church, I don't care where you go, and the preacher gets up to preach and get your Bible out and follow him to make sure he's telling you what the Bible says. If it ain't in the Bible, in the Word of God, it doesn't matter. But this verse here pretty well sums up, clarifies who, what it's all about. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus was the Father in creation, he was the Son in redemption, and He is the Holy Ghost in sanctification. So that, that is a quick trip through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and uh, I hope this kind of satisfied the question that was asked, but before I turn this back to Pastor Miller, I want to say that uh, I have some pamphlets. Sister Brooke's supposed to be making some copies up. And if you need one, if you have a problem understanding who God really is, there's one here, it's called the wheel, the wheel of prophecy. Who is God? This is really, really good. Now, our church has a lot of pamphlets out here on this table that cover water baptism, tithing, Everything, repentance. What is repentance? What is water baptism in the name of Jesus? What is the Holy Ghost? We also have this one out there, and uh, he's going to pass some of these out. But you might know somebody would need this. This is really good. It's, on one side, it says God the Creator. On the other side, it says Jesus the Creator. One of it says Jesus the first and last. The other side is God is the first and last. And it's got scripture. This is just not man's made up deal. This is the word of God. It's got scripture for every one of them. I have that one. And I have another one here. It's called Jesus Christ is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ as God, he is the Father. Jesus Christ as a man, he is the Son of God. Jesus Christ, he is the Holy Spirit. And it's got scriptures for every one of these. So, you know, it kind of, 
It's not my word. It's God's word. This word right here. Every bit of this is backed up by the word of God. Here's another one. It's very interesting. Who was Jesus Christ? As the son of God, he was fleshly human man. As a spirit, he was the great eternal God. And we got scriptures of all, for all of it. It's all in the Bible. And uh, we've got one more that would be beneficiary to you. It's one God named Jesus Christ, one Father named Jesus Christ, got scriptures to back it up, one Son named Jesus Christ, one Spirit named Jesus Christ. All of these are backed up by the Word of God. And the end, that's all that's going to matter because that's what's going to stand in the last day is the Word of God. Pastor. Amen. Let's give Pastor Gwen a hand tonight. I, I knew Pastor Gwen would give you enough scripture to choke a mule. And, uh, and if you didn't write it all down, that's all right. You can go back and watch this. And those uh, pamphlets and different things he's given you are, are great as well. Um, one of the one of the things I learned while in Israel is the biggest issue that Jews have with Christianity. You see, in Israel, most of the, what their what their view of Christianity is the Catholic Church, because when you go there, most you, there's all these holy sites. I mean, they see Catholics come through all the time, and the Jewish people view Christianity Christianity as idolatry. They view Christianity as idolatry because of the Trinity doctrine. Because Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And him alone, him alone shalt thou serve. See, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command these, they shall be in thine heart. They shall teach them diligently unto thy children. They shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down, when thou risest up. You shall bind them as a sign on thine hand and on, they shall be frontless between thine eyes and thou shall write them on the post of the house and on thy gates. Again, you can keep going and going and going. And it's like, why, why would God want to drive into them so much and teach so diligently that God is only one? Was it because he saw the doc doctrine of Trinity coming? Was it because every nation around them served multiple gods? Christ, Christ, apostolic oneness and the Jewish people are the only ones that say there's really only one God. And we know his name, his name is Jesus. We serve one God. And, and, and Jesus, from the beginning, wanted to make sure that his people understood there's one God and one God alone. He said, beside me, there is no other. And so, again, I, I commend Pastor Gwen and thank him for his teaching tonight. Any thoughts or comments? I'm not, Brother, Brother Don, running back there to him. I'm going to go through three more questions tonight, and then we'll be done. I'm just kidding. Well, the first question is I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's hard for, for us to understand is that when God came in the form of Jesus, he was fully man and fully God. That's what scripture teaches us. He said he felt, he, he was like as of we. He was tempted in all ways like, like as we. we. We are all flesh. He was flesh. He came down as, as a flesh I mean, a, a being, a fleshly being. Of course, we know God is a spirit. And so the spirit of God resided in him. Yet at the same time, to be fully flesh, to be able to experience everything like us, means that he was also in need. That's why he prayed. That's why he fasted. Again, because he was fully God, but he also was fully man. And it's, it's again, talking about well, how, how, how could he be both? Do we believe in an omnipresent God? 
Do we believe that God can be in you and 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 be in heaven? Then why is it so hard for us to believe that he could be in the man Jesus and be in heaven? Does he really live inside of me and inside of you and inside of millions of people at the very same time and we think he can't do it with one man? It's something to think about. <laughs> because either we believe it or we don't. I, I, I heard it explained like this one time, this, uh, just a very simple analogy. Um, and, and again, talking about how he could be the Spirit and the Holy Ghost and, and, and the, the Father, the, Holy, the Son, the Holy Ghost, all these different, how could he be these different things? Well, I, I'll, I'll use this. This right here is a great example. This right here, we call it water. To the chemist, it's H2O. It's water. It's, it's a liquid. If I, if I pour it out, um, it pours out, it's liquid. But, you know, I can take this, this liquid, and if I stick it in the freezer, it becomes a solid. So now, now we have different, it, it can be a solid, it can be a liquid. Now I can take it back out of the freezer and put it on the stove, and it will go from a solid to a liquid, and then it will become a gas. Yet in all three forms to the chemist, it's still H2O. So no matter what, whether it's a solid, a gas, or liquid, it's the same thing. I'm here to tell you that, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, they are all the same. They're all God. And there's one God, and his name is Jesus. He has different manifestations. How can it be God in heaven and yet be a cloud by day and or cloud by night, cloud by day and pillar of fire by night? How how could he be in heaven but also be in the burning bush? How could it be all the things we see all through scripture? Well, it makes sense because he's omnipresent. He's God. He can be everywhere. He can be in all things. And again, that's exactly how he came as flesh. He was born of woman, so he was fully man, yet he was fully God at the same time. That's why it's the mystery of the gospel. There's things that our minds, we struggle to comprehend. But it's very clear, and, and God had it taught from the very beginning, that there is one God. God didn't get to the New Testament and change the doctrine and be like, surprise, there's three of us up here. No, there's still just one. It didn't change. He was prophesying about how he was going to come, how he was going to live, how he was going to die. All, it, it was all leading up to that, but it didn't, it didn't all of a sudden, now there's three, and we didn't realize it until thousands of years after God said, there's only one. Not every, not every doctrine that's developed, he talked about the doctrine that came from Revelation, or that, you know, 150 years, uh, Tert Tertullian said, said, well, I had a revelation. Well, Joseph Smith had a revelation too. <laughs> there's a lot of people that had a revelation that don't make it Bible. And that don't make it truth. And so I, I, I get very weary and people are like, oh, I had a revelation that goes against what we read. If it ain't in here, it ain't for us. In, any other questions, thoughts tonight? Hold on. I'm looking around. I was just going to say that in the Bible it states that whether a minister, preacher, teacher, or spirit, angel, whatever, if it says something and it does not agree with the Bible, it is wrong. It doesn't matter the source. That's right. And again, that's where you get into some of these other revelations. Well, an angel came and told me this. Well, Paul said that would happen. <laughs> he said, I don't care if an angel from heaven comes and tells you anything different than what you read in this book. Don't believe it. It's not for you. I got another scripture that uh, Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by all the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's right. Um, we've had a question online, and I'm trying to find the exact scripture. Any other thoughts or comments? Go ahead, Brother Henniger. Several years ago, uh, I was looking upon a uh, scripture that Brother Wim brought up. It says that there are three in heaven that bear witness 
Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, that got my attention because I had a hard time believing there's three in heaven that would do this. So I went back and looked and, and searched. Um, I have a, a Zondervan Bible that gives several different interpretations and it also has the Greek laydown, exactly how it's laid out in the Greek. Well, I got to looking that up and there is no scripture, there are three in heaven. It jumps straight to the next one. There are three in earth that bear a record. It goes to that, but not to three in heaven. So I thought that was very interesting. One of the, there's a question on the live live stream. Um, again, asking the question, but didn't Jesus sit down at God's right hand? Uh, and we do see we do see comments and remarks about sitting at right hand. And again, that that's something we see all through Scripture. That reference about right hand. We saw Stephen when he was being stoned. He said he looked up and I see Jesus standing on the on the right hand of the throne of God. And, and again, that we we understand when it, we see that reference to right to that right hand is referring to the authority to power. And, and so again, we 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 understand that anytime we we see that right hand uh, mentioned, it, it's again talking about the authority and the power that Jesus once he ascended to heaven, he sat down in all power and all authority. And again, that's that scripture. You, we Pastor Glenn already read it. That he, all authority, all power is given unto him. So when he got to heaven, it, he he sat on the throne. All power, all authority was given unto Jesus Christ for all eternity. And again. Um, we understand that Jesus is is the image of the invisible God. There's only one God. You won't read anywhere in Scripture where there's where there's more than one throne in heaven, as it was already said, and it's been we've read it again and again and again. There's only one throne. There's only one God. There's only one that sits on the throne, and His name is Jesus. Amen. Uh, the name the name Jesus means Jehovah is become salvation. And that was the name that was given to him by, by the angel. And that, to me, that's very plain. Jehovah has become salvation. Amen. And we know Jehovah is, is that's what they were, they called the living God all through the Old Testament. We get to the New Testament and he became salvation. That's what his name literally means. Jesus, Je Jehovah has become salvation. Aren't you thankful for salvation? We see it in Old Testament, New Testament. There's only one Savior. Amen, and I'm thankful for our Savior tonight. Any any other questions or comments? Brother Kelvin here. You know, I've grew up under the Trinity all my life, and there's nothing that Pastor said that the Trinity teaching, at least the local teachings, don't agree with. We breathe, When we speak of the Trinity, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And they explain to me so simple as a child that if you ever... A, a quick example, if, if your grandmother made a fresh hot cherry pie and she cut into three equal slices, if it's hot, as soon as the night went through, the, the middle would gel right back together. And if you try to take a piece of pie out, you would dip it, you'd hold your saucer close because you know that middle is going to run. Because inside it's all one. He just divided his outside into three parts, as Pastor is speaking of, for us to help understand the deity and the magnitude of who he is. Because even the first four scriptures, what Pastor said, they described God as a different name, Elohim and El and and. Um, Jehovah, uh, sh sh I can't pronounce it, yeah. but it's talking about four because that's the magnitude of who he is and help our finite minds understand an infinite God. He simply divided himself to help us understand that he is that. But everything over 40 years, what I've heard in the Trinity is exactly what pastor said, that it is one God. It is a father. It's only through Jesus, through salvation to him. So it's like, I was very happy to, you know, to see that. It's the same. It's the same belief. Everything local in the Trinity, maybe the overall, you know, religion or whatever of it is different. Yeah. But locally, that's exactly what the Trinity is: is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, three in one. But it is one God, and yeah, yeah Elohim. Yeah. I'll say and again. I've, and I've talked with many, many Trinitarian Trinitarian pastors, and I would say that we would probably agree, and I believe eighty-five percent of the same thing. I mean, it, it's. It really comes down to, again, are there three different, uh, you know, persons in the Godhead or is there one? That's where I would say the biggest disagreement comes. Is there, because again, with, with the Trinity doctrine, there, there, it is taught that there are three separate persons. 
and again, and I'm not saying everybody that says they're, they're, they're Trinity, but I'm saying the Trinitarians that I've talked to is again that there's, you know, sometimes we pray to the Holy Ghost and sometimes we talk to the Father and there's sometimes we go to the Son. Well, how can we go to one without one to all three? And that's, again, that's where what we're discussing is they, there's only one. If you go to one, you go to all. It's not going to one for this day. And if we need this, I, you know, that's kind of what uh, Pastor Gwen made the comment of, um, you know, his, his struggle before coming to the revelation of oneness is which one do I talk to? Which one do I go to? Um, and so again, and that's where I would say, that's where, and that's why I say, when we use Trinita- Trinitarian or the Trinity doctrine as a whole, there are some Trinitarians I've talked to like you, you know, they're like, well, that's pretty much what I believe. I mean, I've explained oneness to Trinitarians and they're like, yeah, that's what I believe, <laughs> you know, but it's, it really comes down to more of the, uh, we believe there's only one. There's when we get to heaven, there's not going to be three thrones. There's not going to be three persons. There's one person. There's one, one entity, one being that's going to sit, one that sits on the throne. And again, that comes from, from scripture. Brother, Brother Mike. Many of you probably heard this uh, explanation before, but um, when it comes to talking about the different, um, and by most Trinitarian scholars, we're, we're called modalists, uh, modalist monarchians. And uh, that's because the way I've heard it explained is that I'm an uncle, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, I'm a father. But my name is Mike Hornbeck. And when the, when the scripture, uh, Matthew 28, 19 is used um, as far as baptismal formula, um, or to explain the baptismal formula, um, you know, it says in the name, you be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But the name is Jesus, because it's all all three of those are referring back to the name. What is the name? Is is the argument, and uh, so I guess that when I was young, that kind of that helped me uh, kind of grasp uh, what I believed, because I I can fulfill I fulfilled different roles, but it doesn't change who I am. It always comes back to my name is Mike Hornbeck. I am Mike Hornbeck. <laughs> Sorry, Brother Jacob, she trumps you. <laughs> um, the, somebody please show me where it says God the Son in the Bible. I don't believe that's a scriptural term. It does say the Son of God. That's but right. God the Son is a something that came later with the Trinitarian doctrine. Exactly. That actually actually worked out well that she went before me because that packs right along with what I was going to say. Um, the. Trinity, I've, it's something I've tried to study a good bit, and my understanding that the definition of the tw- Trinity is that there is uh, one God who is expressed in three co-equal, co-eternal persons, and one thing I, I've noticed in, in studying the Bible, and that is that you know the Bible does talk about the eternal Father, or the Spirit being uh, eternal, but the Son, you never find anywhere in the Bible where it talks about an eternal Son. The Son is the only begotten of the Father. To be begotten is to have a beginning. And there is no, uh, you know, there's prophecy foretelling the Son in the Old Testament, but there was no existence of the Son until we get to the New Testament. Um, and as far as there, relationship uh, you know brother Don brought up earlier uh, why did Jesus pray to the father uh, the relationship between the two as, as you mentioned he was fully God and fully man and so the the prayer in between I understand that as bringing the flesh that was the son 
into subjection of the Father, setting the example for us. You know, he, Christ came to be an example. And so when he prayed, you know, as the, the brain is just as much flesh as the rest of us, so that fleshly brain may have had thoughts or words that he needed to put under subjection to be in the will of the Eternal Father. All right. Thank you, Brother Jacob. Anyone else? It's it's getting later. Some are already leaving to go home because it's past their bedtime. Somebody keep Pastor Gwen awake now. <laughs> That's fine, Sister Carrie. You just leave. <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> I was just thinking. Um, sometimes uh, this comment's been made once. We, as humans, we can find God and try to put him in boxes that are human. Um, in the begin, back in the beginning, I think it, when it, Moses or Abraham wanted to see God, and he said, "You can't see me without dying because he's so his presence is so powerful." Okay. Well, when we define Trinity or look up the definition, it's talking about being in persons. That's a human term. If you look up person, it's talking about being a humanoid characterization so we're trying to take a being that's always been there doesn't abide by the rules of physics that we know because he's beyond us and we're trying to apply our thought to it and confine him into boxes that we know and God's above all that he's above and beyond our own understanding exactly I mean that's and that's that applies to so much in scripture that we try to explain but it's hard for our minds. Um, perfect example of that, Peter in the scripture on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he saw, you know, Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. You know, of course, if you go back and read it, he was asleep and they woke up. Again, they had a big problem sleeping through big moments in scripture. But thankfully, they woke up towards the end of it and they looked up and like, look at this. And Peter always because he always has to have something to say you know he stood up and said let's build three temples let's build one you know to, to celebrate because at, at, in his finite mind the grandest thing you could do is build a temple to God you know his purview was that the, the temple was, was you know that that was it and so he was like what what you know this is so great what could be better than one temple would be three temples and so again Going back, like you just said, our, our minds, we look, we look through a kind of a, a, a lens of just what our mind can contain and then what we attach it to. And so we try to, we try to fit things, we try to fit God and his, his ways into our finite minds and trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I even transpose all of this and how, how do I, you know, respond by, by what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. And, and, and though we, we, we don't always make sense of it or we say the right thing or do the right thing because... We're not God, and our minds don't work like that. He works outside of space and time, and our minds only work inside of space and time. And so, in any last comments? Brother Garrett said no more questions. He's not bringing the microphone. I'm just kidding. Come on, we're up here. We got one more. One, one, one comment. Super short comment, and then we're going home. <laughs> when, when Brother Gwen was teaching, the thing that jumped into my mind. The very first scripture he said, in the beginning, God created. And then when he jumped in the New Testament, and I forget the scripture it was, but it said God was manifest in the flesh, which we know that's when he came in Jesus. But to say, because when you read it in Genesis 1 and 1, God created the heavens and the earth. So you see, this is a great big God. Big God. Big, big God. But then when it says, but then God manifests himself in the flesh, it's like, well, okay, but that's a little God. No, that's the same God that created in the beginning. That same God manifests himself in flesh. So that just jumped out at me, and I've been not going to say anything the whole time. I was like, well, if it keeps on my brain, I'm going to say something. So... <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Now it's time to go. <laughs> I'm going to say something. All right, let's stand. <laughs>
And again, I want to thank everyone for, for coming tonight. And, and again, this has been a wonderful discussion. And this is something, again, if, if, if any of you still have questions, I, I would be more than happy to sit down anytime and go and talk about these things, discuss these things. Again, the question tonight was not talking about any de denomination, but talking about the, the doctrine of Trinity, which by definition um, literally means a, a, a Godhead of one God in three persons. And so that is what we were discussing, just to, to, to clarify as well, when we say Trinitarian or Trinity doctrine, it's the doctrine that there are three separate persons that manifest it in, in one Godhead. And, and so just wanted to, to clarify there as well. But why don't we lift our hands and let's give God praise tonight before we leave. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, Heavenly Father. God, we are thankful for all that you've done, all that you're doing. Thank you for manifesting yourself to us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to know who you are. God, I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself in every way. God, we give you praise for all that you've done and all that you're doing. And we pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus.